All right, Church, uh, Church on the Rock. Uh, this is the message for uh, June 28th, 2020. Uh, kind of titled this message, uh, Itching Ears. And what I want to talk about is one of my favorite prophets. Uh, so some of you are thinking, okay, whether well, that's uh, Jeremiah, no, Isaiah, no, Ezekiel. No, although all those are great guys, I like them all. This is one you probably are not as familiar with. Uh, his name is Micaiah. Not Micah, but Micaiah. And we're going to be going to, starting in actually 1 uh, Kings chapter 8, so you can go ahead and turn there. Our main focus is going to be actually on 1 Kings chapter 22. But there's a little background I want to give before we get to the chapter 22. This is going to be our main focus. Uh, but first, I want to give you a little background of, of what's going on in the time frame. Uh, this is at a time after the split uh, civil war between uh, what was once Israel, uh, after Solomon's son took over, after Solomon died, named Rehoboam. And, uh, and there was a, a division that started between the two tribes uh, in Jerusalem, Judah, uh, which was uh, the, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, and the other ten tribes of the northern part separated. So it's like they had a civil war, kind of like we had a civil war, except in that case the, un the union wasn't preserved. And uh, as they went their separate way, the uh, leader of the... Uh, uh, northern ten tribes, that's why we sometimes refer to them the lost ten tribes, because they were later taken into captivity by Assyria in uh, 722 B.C. Uh, but he introduced almost immediately uh, idol worship uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel. So you got the Judah in the south with Jerusalem, and you have uh, Israel, the ten tribes in the north. And he brought those idols in, uh, actually calves. He made calves and had the people worship there because they didn't want them going back to Jerusalem to worship because they were afraid that he would lose their loyalty. And so throughout their history between Israel and Judah, there were, there were uh, many times where they were at war with one another. There were other times when they were at peace. Now by the time we get to chapter 22 uh, in Kings, 1 Kings, uh, they're at a time of peace. And what happened was that, uh, as I said earlier, Israel was taken into captivity in 722 B.C. by the Assyrian Empire. And again, they were the first ones to begin to worship idols, fall away from the Lord. Uh, and then the result was that uh, the Assyrians came over. Uh, their capital city at that time of Israel was Samaria, and they destroyed Samaria they took uh, those who weren't killed, were taken captives, and they were moved uh, out of that region as slaves. Uh, while Judah lasted a little longer, they had they had some good kings. They had uh, not a lot, you know, not everyone, but they had some. They had some like Hezekiah. They had Asa. They had uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Uh, while the northern kingdom, Israel, really did not so much really didn't have any what we could call good godly kings. And so as we pick up this story, uh, again, they've been war at different times, but this is a time of, of uh, where they're not warring with one another. And this is a, a very familiar story in chapter 18 that I kind of need to set this up before we get to uh, chapter 22 so you can have an understanding of, of what's going on in 22. But uh, in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, it's, it's the story, uh, probably one of the biggest showdowns, uh, power showdowns in, in the Bible. Uh, this is where Elijah, Elijah was, uh, he actually challenged Ahab, who was a king of uh, Israel, who also had a, a very uh, ungodly wife by the name of Jezebel, I think Everyone's heard of that name. Uh, and he challenged uh, Ahab to gather all the people of Israel to Mount Carmel. And his purpose was so that the people would either decide either Baal was God 
or the Lord was God. And so he wanted a power showdown. And so he asked that the, uh, that the 450 prophets of Baal be brought there with all of Israel, and also the 400 prophets of Asherah, which was a female goddess, uh, but they didn't come, which is, is kind of interesting uh, as we get longer into the story. So he brings them to uh, Mount Carmel. Uh, he tells each to give him a, 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 a bull calf to sacrifice, and, and the, the prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, they take their they sacrifice, and he tells them to build an altar, and, uh, and upon that altar put that, that bull, and then sacrifice to Baal, and he said, The God who answers by fire, he is God. So they all agree to that. All Israel thought that, think, Judah thinks that's good, and, and so as they, they go on with this story, and, and uh, as the, the prophets of Baal are, are praying and asking for their Lord to, you know, to answer and to answer by fire and to burn their sacrifice, and it doesn't happen. And it says to start in the morning, it goes to noon, and there's still nothing is happening. And, and Elijah begins to give him a little trash talk. Uh, you know, he says, uh, perhaps Baal's out, maybe he's in the bathroom, or maybe he's taking a nap, uh, maybe he's lost or something. Uh, and so he's really giving them the business, basically. And they begin to actually cut themselves and to sacrifice themselves, cut and gashes and bloods running all over to, to elicit a response from Baal. Well, nothing happens. And then it says it comes to the time of the evening sacrifice, and then uh, it's, it's Elijah's turn. So he takes his sacrifice, puts it on the, on the altar that he has made. Uh, he then asks that they bring uh, water, a uh, big jar, bucks of water, pour over the sacrifice, soak it down real good, does that three times, and they even have a trench around it, fill the trench with, with water. And, and after that, he prays, and then fire falls from heaven, consumes uh, the sacrifice and the altar, and licks up all the water, it says, in the trenches. And then when, they, when the Israelites see that, they all fall to the ground and say, The Lord... He is God. And at that point, uh, Elijah tells them to gather up all the 450 uh, prophets of Baal to bring them down to uh, uh, the Strip Kidron, and then they sacrifice, they don't sacrifice them, they actually slaughter them, uh, all 450 prophets. So this is probably one of the greatest power encounters that we've seen between the true God and the false god, and the power of this power encounter. And so the people, as they fell their face, they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So, so as we go on with that story, then, of course, right after that, we're not going to take time to go to that, but that's when Jezebel threats Elijah, says that just as you have killed them, if your life tomorrow, your life is going to be like theirs. So she threatens and he flees. But we're going to go ahead uh, and, and move along to chapter 20 because I want to kind of get more in the update where we are. But in chapter 20, uh, this is a story a couple of different times where Ahab, uh, even though he's a, uh, an evil king, he's at war with, uh, not with Judah, but he's at war with Aram or Syria, same thing. And uh, so what happens here? Is that even though he was a uh, an evil god, God, or e he was an evil king, the Lord still, because of his name's sake, gave him victories over Syria. And in one of these cases, uh, he had a great line. Uh, in fact, if you look at chapter twenty and verse uh, ten and eleven, and this Ben Hadad, who is the king of Syria, of Aram. He has come to, uh, to destroy, to attack uh, Samaria. And it says in verse 10, it says, Ben, ben Hadid sent another message to Ahab. May the, God, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if enough dust remains in Samaria to give each of, his, each of my men 
a handful. And Samaria was a capital city of Israel, just as Jerusalem was a capital city of Judah. But here's a great line in verse 11. It says, The king of Israel answered, Tell him the one who puts on his armor should not boast like the one who takes it off. So it kind of reminds me of that that line that, uh, you know, in the Battle of the Bulge in the Second World War where the Germans were wanting the uh, uh, the Allies to the American army to surrender, and the answer was just strictly it was nuts, and that was it. But the one who puts on his armor should not boast like the one who takes it off. And in that same chapter, so long story short, uh, the Lord enables Ahab to defeat the enemy. Uh, and then if you skip on over to, to verse uh, 28, the next spring, uh, Ben Haddon comes again, raises another army, and he comes to attack uh, Samaria again. And we're going to start in verse 28. And it says, The man of God came up and told the king of Israel, this is what the Lord says. Because the Syrians think the Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valley, I will deliver this vast army into your hands, and you will know that I am the Lord. Now for seven days they camped opposite each other, and on the seventh day the battle was joined. Now the Israelites inflicted, inflicted a hundred thousand casualties on the Syrian foot soldiers in one day. The rest of them escaped to the city of Apec, where the walls collapsed on 27,000 of them, and Ben Haddon fled to the city and hid in an inner room. So the Syrians suffered 127,000 casualties in one day. It's, it's kind of hard for us to wrap our, our mind around how in one day, uh, can you imagine our army losing 127,000 in one day? So, he, so the Lord gave Ahab a, a great victory. Problem was, uh, if you go on down and read past that, instead of taking ben Hadid and ex executing him, he actually took him and made a treaty with him. And that was not what was on the Lord's plan. The Lord had de devoted him to destruction. And so as we pick that story up in verse 35, and it said, By the word of the Lord, one of the sons of the prophets said to his companion, Strike me with your weapon. But the man refused. So the prophet said, Because you have not obeyed the Lord, as soon as you leave me, a lion will kill you. And after the man went away, a lion found him and killed him. Now the prophet found another man and said, Strike me, please. So the man struck him and wounded him. Then the prophet went and stood by the road, waiting for the king. Now he disguised himself with his headband down over his eyes. And as the king passed by, the prophet called out to him, Your servant went into the thick of the battle, and someone came to me with a captive and said, Guard this man. If he is missing, it will be your life for his life, or you must pay a talent of silver. Now while your servant was busy here and there, the man disappeared. This is your sentence, the king of Israel said. You have pronounced it yourself. Then the prophet quickly removed the headband from his eyes, and the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. He said to the king, this is what the Lord says. You have set free a man I have determined should die. Therefore, it is your life for his life, your people for his people. Sullen and angry, the king of Israel went to his palace in Samaria. So the word of the Lord comes, comes through the prophet and tells Ahab, your life for his life. And so basically pronouncing that judgment will be coming on Ahab. Now the next chapter, chapter 21, again, I don't want to take a lot of time with that, but just to say there was a, what else also happened was there was a man who had a vineyard named Naboth. He had a vineyard, but it happened to be right next to the king's palace. 
and the king's palace, and the king wanted that vineyard so that he could make a garden because it was so handy because it's right next to his palace. And so he was trying to buy it from Naboth, but Naboth wouldn't sell it because it was a part of his inheritance had been passed down. And so Ahab was very upset, and he tells Jezebel about it. Jezebel uh, then comes up with a plan, and basically he's, she tells the elders of the city to get together and say and call a fast, and then have people uh, falsely accuse Naboth of cursing the king and cursing God. And they did that, and then they let him out, and they stoned him to death. So uh, Ahab got the guy's vineyard that he was going to make to the garden. But we'll pick up that story uh, in verse 17. So after this has happened, this is what happened in verse 17. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth vineyard, where he is gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. So there comes the word of the Lord again against King Ahab. So that brings us to chapter 22. And again, the, the story of Micaiah, probably again one of the prophets you probably are not as familiar with. And we're just going to kind of read through this because it's a very interesting story, but we needed to put uh, this background first before we went into it so you can understand where we're at, what's going on here. So in chapter 22, verse 1, says, for three years there was no war between Syria and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, remember he was a good king, went down to see the king of Israel. Now the king of Israel had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, to us and yet we have done nothing to, make, to take it, retake it from the Syrians? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? So in other words, uh, Ahab wants Je Jehoshaphat to bring Judah, his army, with him and go together with him. And Jeho Jehoshaphat replies to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people is your people. My horses is your horses. But Jeho Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400 men, and asked them, Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Now he brought these prophets, it says it's 400. Well, remember, back in the big showdown with the prophets of Baal, there were 450 prophets of Baal who were there, but the 400 prophets of Asherah were not there. So I believe that's who these prophets are that he's brought. And they answered him, said, uh, Go. They answered, For the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here whom we may acquire of? So I don't think Jehoshaphat was really trusting their words. And the king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one man through whom we can acquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, the son of Imla. The king should not say that, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once. Now dressed in his royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on the thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria, with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Kaniah, 
had made iron horns, and he declared, This is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said. For the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Now the messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, as one man the other prophets are predicting success for the king. Let your words agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. Now when he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead? Or shall I refrain? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Now, that is a sarcastic, mocking tone uh, in which he gave that. Because in verse 16, the next verse, the king says to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So, verse 17, then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? So in verse 19, it says, Micaiah continued, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the host of heaven standing around him, on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? So it says that in that verse 19, it says that, that he saw the throne and with all the heavenly hosts around him. This is, again, a, a picture of, of what most scholars refer to the divine council. In other words, that the Lord has a council uh, that he works with. Just as he works with us as human agents, he works with others, those supernatural agents. We have examples, of course, in Job, uh, with the story of Job, and how even in that case Satan was even coming into the, the council there. Uh, we haven't mentioned in De Deuteronomy 32 and Deuteronomy 33, uh, different uh, uh, Psalms 82, uh, which talks about the counsel of God. So he has this counsel, verse 19, and in verse 20 he says, And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? Now one suggested this and another that. Now finally a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Kenaniah, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, You will find out on the day you go to hide in the inner room. The king of Israel then ordered, Take Micaiah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, This is what the Lord says. This is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah declared, If you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, Mark my words, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. 
And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, Do not fight with anyone, small or great, except the king of Israel. Now when the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, again, who is the king of Judah, they thought, surely this is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But when Jehoshaphat cried out, the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel and stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the section of his armor. The king told his chariot driver, Wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged, and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Syrians. The blood from his wounds ran into the floor of the chariot, and that evening he died. As the sun was setting, a cry spread throughout the army, every man to his town and every one to his land. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried him there. They washed a chariot in a pool in Samaria, where the prostitutes bathed, and the dogs licked up his blood as a word of the Lord had declared. So exactly what uh, the prophet Elijah had, had said, the dogs would lick his blood out of happened just as uh, the prophet before had told him that his life for your life it transpired and yet King Ahab had surrounded himself with with 400 prophets that would tell him what he wanted to hear that would tell him only the good news would only tell him how he's going to prosper and would not necessarily tell him the true word of the Lord there's only one Micaiah, who would speak the truth in the name of the Lord. Now, there's one other scripture I want to look at, compare this to the, in the New Testament, and that's First uh, Timothy, or actually Second Timothy, maybe that's Second Timothy chapter four. So, if you turn back there, remember all your T's are together. Second Timothy chapter four, and we're going to look at just verses one through three. And this is, uh, of course, Paul is writing to his uh, young pastor, Timothy, and giving him instructions. And in verse 1, chapter 4, it says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, Correct, rebuke, and encourage. Two out of three of those are kind of on the negative side. Correct, rebuke, encourage, and with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come, here's a key verse, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And I think that's where we're at today in much, uh, much of the church today in the United States. Uh, we have acquired teachers who uh, only tell us positive messages, only things that encourage so that we can go to church, uh, be encouraged, and it's good to be encouraged, but we also need to hear the truth that we may be going in through some severe times, some troubling times. Uh, and I think there's a fault on both sides where we have the people, it says, who acquire for themselves teachers who would tickle their ears. And then we have teachers who are more than willing, because who wants to be the bad guys to talk about bad news? But we need to hear both the good and the bad. And I think now in our nation, we are in a time where several times uh, Jesus would say, you know, watch and pray. 
that we're in that type of time where we need to be watching what's happening and praying. Because I feel like our nation is in the balance. In these next probably six months, we'll probably determine the way we're going. And I don't know what the future holds. I don't know who's going to win the next election. But I do know that depending on what happens in that election, we could very well be coming under persecution. And I don't think the church in America is prepared for persecution. We usually are only prepared for being prospered and grow and everything going good and well, but I think we are in a dangerous time. There's a scripture out of uh, Jeremiah 12, verse 5. I'll just read it to you. You might want to mark it down. Jeremiah 12, verse 5. It says, If you have raced with men on foot, and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? I'll read that again. If you have raced with men on foot, this is the Lord speaking to Jeremiah, and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? In other words, we might say, uh, translate that into suck it up, buttercup. In other words, if we're struggling now with what's going on with this COVID virus, with uh, the economy situation, with uh, the riots, with the, uh, the destruction, we need to get a grip and gird ourselves up, realizing that it's going to be a bumpy ride these next, especially six months. And we really need to be paying attention. We need to be praying for our nation. Again, realizing that we are in the balance. Which way we could go, I don't know. There needs to be a repentance in the nation and a turning from evil to good. But right now I'm not seeing that. But I pray that happens. I pray that we do have a future. I pray that the Lord will once again leave behind a blessing. We have that perhaps of God. It talks about in, in the prophets that perhaps God will leave behind a blessing. But right now we are in a place of where we need to be awake awaken to what's going on, praying and interceding for our nation. It's a critical time. We also need to be girded up in our own spirit that if these things do happen, many more negative things coming, many more shakings, that we are not shaking ourselves. Because the danger is if you only hear the good news, then when the shaking happens, people's faith are shaken. If you are expecting it to happen, and you know that God is in control, which he is in control, you're not shaking. Your faith isn't shaking. So we need to be standing upon the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock, the sure foundation. So my encouragement for you today is not to be in fear. Yes, things are changing. Yes, things are, are shaking. But trust in the Lord. But watch and pray. Watch what's going on. Be prepared and be a light in the time of darkness. Again, it's that Isaiah 60 time where it says deep darkness covers the people. Do you arise and shine and let your light shine? So let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, I just thank you that you're preparing a people that regardless of what happens, Lord, that you will gird up, that you will strengthen. Lord, I, I just pray that you would do a mighty work in each of our lives, Lord. That we would be steadfast, faithful. And Lord, even in a time of persecution that may be coming around the corner, Lord, that we would stand fast. And Lord, knowing even that much of the Chinese church is praying for us the Western Church, to undergo persecution so that we might be purified. We don't look forward to persecution, Lord. But if that's what's on the horizon, Lord, we want to be prepared and we want to be faithful and stand in the midst of that persecution. So, Lord, I ask for your grace. I ask that this will be the time that your church arises and takes its place 
and be and becomes that light, becomes that that city set up on a hill. That when the others others are looking around, looking for answers, that they would see our faith, they would see our peace, and they would be asking us, where is your hope? And we could give them the hope that is Christ Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for this day. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.